All right, I'm just gonna get started. Um, and anybody that misses my introduction will can rewatch that, that 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our artist talk with Misha Goldberg and Corey Price. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land I'm tuning in from today, the Monacan Nation, and to pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. My name is Sri Kotakala, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at Second Street Gallery, a 501c3 nonprofit art space located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This is a Zoom webinar, so you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. So you can kick back and relax for the next hour. We will have an open Q&A session for the artists at the end of the talk. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box. And if there's something that makes sense to answer immediately, I'll ask the artists to do that. But in general, we'll try and hold all the questions till the very end. For tonight's Artists in Conversation, we are joined by artists and collaborators, Misha Goldberg and Corey Price, for a conversation on their recent creative partnership for our Inside the Artist Studio exhibition. Inside the Artist Studio opened in Second Street Gallery's main gallery space on December 3rd and will remain on view until January 21st. The group exhibition features the work of 10 Central Virginia-based painters, printmakers, and photographers. For this exhibition, Second Street Gallery's chief curator, Kristen Chacha, paired one painter or printmaker with one photographer to form a long-term creative relationship. The artist pairs began collaborating on the project in summer of 2021. Over the course of the past six months, photographers documented their partner artists' studio practice and process as they created work specifically for the exhibition at Second Street Gallery. The exhibition is generously sponsored by Roy Kadoff and Debbie Watt, Martin Horn Incorporated, and a grant from Bama Works. Before I hand over the floor to our artists, I'll introduce Misha and Corey. Misha Goldberg is an artist and farmer living in a secluded valley on ancestral Monacan territory. She uses a variety of mediums, including paint, ritual performance, and poetry to speak to humanity's belonging and responsibility to the earth. Her experiences journeying through, journeying through monocultures, standing on front lines, and living off the land have all served as inspiration throughout her evolving work. Misha has exhibited in galleries across the country with solo shows in Portland, Los Angeles, and Seattle, and will have her next solo show, Daughterland, in April 2022 here at Second Street Gallery. Corey Price is a photographer and writer based in Charlottesville, Virginia. Originally from Culpeper, Corey has been proud to call Central Virginia home for most of her life and is passionate about telling the stories of her community. Corey holds a BS in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech and seeks to maintain a balance between her technical and creative interests with her work. She's also the host of the Charlottesville chapter of Creative Mornings and is a founding member of the Charlottesville Black Arts Collective. Corey is currently in residence at New City Arts Initiative, working toward her first solo show at Welcome Gallery in January, 2022. She has been a writer in residence at McGuffey Art Center and her work has been exhibited at New City Arts Initiative, the Bridge Progressive Arts Initiative, Studio X and McGuffey Art Center. Thank you both Misha and Corey for joining us this evening. I'm gonna hand things over to the two of you. All right, thank you, Shree. Um, hello, good evening. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, how, how should we kick things off? Where, where should we start? Um, well, I guess uh, perhaps first I should say that, you know, we were paired together um, last year year um, or the, earlier this year um, to work on this project together and we never really met one another um, we had both uh, uh, been editors for the zine Mala Leche that had come out and that's how we became familiar with each other's work um, which I really admired your work then so it was really a joy to like meet in this really intimate way welcoming you to my home and you kind of taking on 
my work and its content and my life and trying to express something of it, of what you saw. So I really appreciate that focus that you put on, on my process. I, um, you know, it, it was one of those things where I kind of just been admiring your work from afar. Um, and I, I think we were, when we were talking at the show opening, you know, it was, it was, this was fate, you know, we were going to meet one way or another. Um, and I'm just so happy that it was through the show that we, we did get a chance to meet and to, to really just get to know each other very quickly. Um, <laughs> and, um, to be able to collaborate on something that, um, you know, that is, I feel like is so central to your work and gave me this opportunity to think in new ways with, with mine. Um, so I just wanted to echo the appreciation of just getting a chance to, to, to work with you and to meet you and, and to, to, you know, be your friend. Yeah. Um, Shree, are people seeing us or are they seeing the screen? They're seeing the screen right now. Okay. I can turn it off to the two of you. They can, they can see you, I think on the side, but um, mostly the screen. Could, okay, cool. Maybe we could skip over a few slides. Um, I guess uh, I had, um, yeah, I had um, mostly painted and, and done a lot of uh, oil painting, poetry before this, before coming to the farm where I live in Virginia um, four years ago. And um, I'd taken a break doing work and then I'd gone to see this, um, this uh, folk art exhibit in New York City with my aunt and um, and seeing this outsider art show and it's like after not doing work for quite a for a couple of years and like really my soul yearning to like process what I was going through um, like I came upon this um, this style of work and it which was actually inspired by this love letter someone gave me a few years ago and so I um, and so this is like a whole new thing for me to do. And I really started doing it when, um, we could stop here. I started doing it when, um, uh, when the pandemic started and I really needed to be processing, um, like just processing this, these past years of living on the land, living kind of secluded and, 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 also, and like in a very self-reliant way and like learning to be um like a steward and in like intimate relationship with with the land with the farm with my food with growing food with chopping wood with you know um like living this other way and so I, that was like really yearning to come out in the artwork and so so i kind of came upon this like psychic animal map of like trying to like express the land like express this like um, uh, kinship with the, with the deer, which was really like coming up for me strong of like being this like fellow living animal, you know, like my neighbor, like my deer is my neighbor. And this is like my love letter to my neighbor. Um, and so it was really like when we first came upon um, on like how we were going to document the studio because I just work in my home on my kitchen table or in the corner it's not really like like much of like a studio studio it's it's my house well uh, we came up on the idea of branching out into the forest and so i really loved how this i how this approach to working kind of mirrored what i was doing which is kind of creating this map of the land and my relationship to it in this multi-dimensional way and this layered way um, so I, I think I, I really love the photos for how they, um, they like created this other layer of inhabiting art, inhabiting relationship uh, and space. Yeah, I think one of the things that was sort of instantly apparent to me was that, you know, the studio is beyond your home. Um, and it is, you know, it's, it's, it's not as formal of a, of a space, right? It's somewhere where you are actively in every day, walking in every day, um, interacting with the wildlife that's, that's 
in your forest and in the fields. And I think that's absolutely reflected in your work. Um, and to me, it just felt like, you know, in order to really document you and your studio, it, it really was to document the process. And also I think like the thinking that, that comes with um, sort of what you're trying to do with some of your pieces. Um, so specifically with your, your deer mask, um, I think we've got a photo in there um, coming up. There it is. Um, you know, that's the one, you know, we were just kind of in your, in your kitchen and we were just chatting um, and, you know, getting to see a completed piece before everybody else was pretty exciting. Um, and it just felt like we needed to, to work with your idea um, and bring that to life in a way. And, you know, I didn't have words for it at the time. I didn't know, you know, I had a feeling, I had a feeling that I wanted to, to try to create on a photograph. Um, and I was like, Hey, you want to try this? <laughs> um, and, and I'm so happy that we, we did. Um, because I think once we started moving in the, in the forest, um, and then moving in the field, um, we really just created this kind of conversation in the, in some of the pieces where it's, you know, um, I think we've got the one in there with her in the tree. Um, and then like on one side and one on the other, or we could pause here. So, um, in the field, you know, I, I think it was, I think it was important to kind of capture what it could be like to be a human behind the mask, but also inhabiting this idea that you're, you are a part of the forest. You are a neighbor of, of your land as well. Um, and able to, to be like a herd of deer in the field. Um, so that's sort of some of the inspiration there. And then the photo on the left side. Um, so before Misha and I got back together the second time, I kind of told her, you know, I, uh, I really, I really would love to see, see some deer. Um, and we nicknamed it the deer safari. So we were going to try our best to see some deer. Um, she knew the spots around her property where, you know, deer usually come in the, in the afternoon at dusk and, and all of that good stuff. So I was head on a swivel. There were some, some false starts with some mushrooms. Um, I don't know if you remember that or not. You got all excited. Okay. Yeah, you do got all excited about like, Oh, look over there. I'm like, okay, dear, 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 dear. I'm ready. I'm ready. And some mushrooms. <laughs> which now I'll have to try these I'm mushrooms. I'm pretty excited about finding mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm going to have to try, try some of these if they're that good. Um, but um, after, after that, just, we were in the meadow and um, there are these beautiful yet monster sized Belgian horses um, that are also in this meadow with us. And over the hill comes a herd of deer, a little small herd of deer. And they just stop and look at us. And Misha's got the mask in one hand and is just like holding it. I'm like down on the grass, like, okay, I don't want them to see me. I don't want to move, but I also want to get photos. And um, they just kind of came down in the field a little bit, looked at us, the rest ran. But the one that you kind of see here is like an apparition or an echo in this left piece stayed there and looked. And then later on, I had once once the deer had moved out, I had Misha go and and stand in that same sort of area where the deer just were, sort of to show that um, the landscape's always changing. Um, and though at the time that we're looking at it, we may not see who's been there or what's been there, they have been there. They have inhabited that area, um, and you know, um, they have for for centuries, right? Um, so I think as we're talking about layers and adding another layer into your work, I think there's also something there with talking about layers of time, um, which I, I know that is something that we've discussed a little bit about too, um, es especially with, you know, how, how do you layer on meaning into your work? Um, and I think this was sort of a neat thing that um, I felt was the right move to make in the moment. But later on in reflection, I realized, okay, this is this was the layer. Now I have words to explain what you and I were doing um, on that day that we we met. Yeah, yeah. I um, like from the beginning, I was like 
skeptical about the way that a photographer can come into somebody's space and extract something that is or isn't there. And so like, I was very interested in, in the way that a collaboration between two artists is much more like, like, um, like a chemical reaction that can create something altogether, like can create the moment of the joy of art making and create something of two minds coming together. And like, that's like with the philosophy of the third mind and the cutoffs that is kind of running through this show of like what happens when two people come together to create something it's like they can make they make a baby they don't make like they don't take something from the other person you know that's not that's not theirs you know or represent it in a way so like it was just you know like i've been working with thinking about mass because i've been thinking about the way that like i've been researching the shamanic practices of my mother's lineage um, from Korea and and thinking of these things like sacred, like um, enshrined trees, masks, um, totem poles, like these objects that are kind of uh, cross-cultural through indigenous cultures around the world of ways of representing spirit uh, or way or objects that hold spirit or ways of sacralizing um, places um, or ways of, of inhabiting other identities. Um, and so I, um, so it was, we, first we did some photographs of me holding the art in the forest and then I'm like, well, why don't I make a mask and we, I can, you know, can wear the mask. And um, yeah, that moment with the deer was just like really cool because, you know, it's Corey's like, you know, like, oh, could we could find some deer? And I'm like, yeah, I'll find us some deer. Like, I could make some deer show up. And luckily, it's a time of year where there's a lot of deer, there's a lot of deer kind of moving around. So they were coming around in the evening. Um, and um, and yeah, I'm standing there with with the mask on, and these deer come over the hill and come straight towards us, and. It's just so, like, and we're both like in this like ecstatic rapture of like, you know, like laughing and but trying to be like really still, and that's I think one thing that I learned from the animals is like in an encounter there's like there's like the stillness you take on of like not wanting to encroach on their space, wanting to feel like a safe like you're in like a safe vibration for them to be in and that you're peaceful, you know, and like just entering and that, and just entering into that space together really is like, there's such a moment opened up that is like, is timeless and is in like, you, you like are in some of the purity of what they are, you know, like they're not in the guile of humanity, of a, being a person. Like we all know like how duplicitous we are in our mind going one way and our mouth going the other way, you know? And so I feel like I really want, it was so nice that that moment could open up for me and Corey because that that's not something that's promised. Like you go to your art and you want, you ask for the magic to happen, to communicate something that's transcendent, that is, um, that comes from your in, inward life to communicate to another be person. And so like, it just, it really happened that time in that moment. And it was like the last light, like beautiful light. And the last moment it could have happened to take a photograph and, and it happened. And I think it really, like Corey, you really got it in the photographs, what that feeling was. Thank you. I am. So I wanted to ask, you know, when we were in that moment, just sort of in the field watching them and they stopped, um, do you think, because it, it almost seemed kind of unnatural that they would just stop and watch us like that. Um, and then there was five or six of them and then all but one left. And it just felt like that there was some curiosity there, but hearing you speak about 
sort of this exchange between human and animal. I'm wondering, is that something in the moment that you were very focused on sort of preserving? And maybe that's why the deer stuck around for a little bit. I, I'm just kind of curious what your, your perception is on that. Um, no, I think it was kind of unusual moment. I mean, in that moment, I was trying to be very still you know, and really trying to enjoy it, you know, it's like life is, you know, those moments in life, they come and like be, you know, like, it, like we should just be in them, you know, like really be in it, you know, and just like the animals, they're just in, you know, they're not thinking about too much other than that moment. So it was just so like, it was just like rapturous, you know, of, of like the, that we get that encounter um so i was i was i kind of even forgot i had the mask but then once i realized i had the mask i'm like wow what's going on you know like and then you said afterwards like was the deer seeing like seeing the mask and like seeing the ears up and seeing like like was it like wondering what was going like who that two-legged deer was you know? <laughs> um, so yeah all i can say is that i think i think animals really do pick up on intention like i hear um i've heard from hunters uh, my friend who says oh when he goes to hunt like if he goes to hunt squirrels, he sees a lot of deer. When he goes to hunt deer, he he sees nothing but squirrels. So it's kind of like there's like a vibe that you that that animals pick up on that they know if you're a predator, they know what your what your energy is. So I think that 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 happens too. Yeah, that's interesting to to kind of think about. Um, I hadn't thought about you know, if you're hiking or as you're walking through the, the forest, wherever you might be, that um, your intention there is, is, is important. Um, and that animals are going to pick up on that. They're going to know why you're in, in their, in their sort of landscape, right? Um, so that's, that's interesting to know and to think about. Um, so, I kind of wanted to ask as well, um, there's a lot of symbolism in your work um, and just wanted to, to talk about, um, especially, yeah, especially in this piece, um, you know, the lines are beautiful, the smoke or the, not the smoke, but the, um, like if it's cold outside, the condensation, the breath coming from the horse is beautiful. I just wanted to know, um, you know, as you work, are the symbols that you sort of arrive to and the imagery that you arrive to, does that just sort of happen as a part of the process? Or is that something that you plan or have been thinking about and becomes intentional in that piece or the pieces you're creating? Uh, well, uh, these pieces were a pretty organic stream of consciousness as far as it goes. Like, and that's something that I wanted to evolve from from my paintings because my my previous paintings, my process was very planned out and like kind of uptight. And I really wanted to connect with the process that was a lot more fluid and joyful, like when you're a kid and you're doodling and you're just, you know, can you're not trying to make something, you know, specific. And so like I wanted that process to really be open. So um, so yeah, like now when I look at this piece, it, I'm like, oh, that's, it's what it means to me, you know, and that's what, how it all comes together. Um, so, so yeah, I like, like this, like talking about time and breaking up time, like this, this, um, really, uh, is about like the end, like thinking about the history of the, of horses and humanity together and the way that you know when those cave paint uh those um petroglyphs were done uh, which were um, borrowed from mongolian um uh, petroglyphs um like at first 
humans observe horses as wild animals and then slowly like how did humans and the horses first start to interact you know they were food before and then and then eventually they they tame you know they you get a horse and you tame them and then like this taming process happens and then there's this culture that builds and then there's this um like whole history that merges um together and so I was kind of speaking to that and like the human being and the horse, like they both kind of symbolize like one is the one is, you know, has this kind of domesticated power over nature and the horse is some is is, you know, the this animal that has come into the humans' lives and served humanity. And so um, you know, and thinking too about domesticated animals, you know there's like some like nefarious tone to that, but there's also, I think like a great service that these animals have played in our humanity, uh, you know, in civilization. And so there's like a way to um, like create a culture of revering those animals that have served us, um, you know, by as food or as transportation or workers or any number of things, you know, they, they've like given a great gift to us. And so that feeling of of their service is like, oh, like that's how awesome they are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you sort of show the combination of that. Cause something that I just realized in this piece, I think from afar, I, I just the way that the horse is, is running. And then in the other piece, how the deer is running is very similar. So it's almost, and then of course you've got the the human, you know, riding the horse. So you get to see that sort of um, interplay or parallel between, you know, a, a wild animal versus domesticated versus domest domesticator. Um, and I just noticed that and just wanted to point that out that those, both of those pieces really tie together um, and show in a way of, of how similar um all of us are as animals but they also show the, the the distinction in the line that sort of separates us um and then you know sort of just kind of thinking about us collaborating together um being able to to bring your work into action um i thought was sort of important for this because sure i could i could come and document you in your studio as you're working and i and i did we did do a little bit of that as well but i i think one of the things that we had talked about is really you know that encounter with the deer um just in talking about your work being able to put you behind the mask and then also show you in the same frame without the mask sort of shows the same sort of parallels here that that i kind of mentioned in um as your your work yeah so what i'm sort of talking about is is both of these images here um and i just want to say that we your forest is just this beautiful um really lovely place and has this sort of magic quality to it um where i feel like there's something about the way the background, something about the way the forest looks that just feels like it was alive. Um, so I just, I wanted to mention that. Um, <laughs> um, but also just kind of wanted to talk about um, liminal spaces, you know, boundary spaces, places where, where boundaries can come together and, and meet. Um, I think we did a little bit of that here and just sort of creating this um, almost fictional yet real space together. I was wondering, you know, as as you're working or reflecting on your work, is that something that you enjoy doing is creating like a hybrid or a liminal space? Yeah. Because everything that is unsaid or unknown is in that space. That's true. So where so how does this like this like ephemeral presence like like what were you wanting to capture? And then what was, what is the, the feeling that you, that you got from it? And um, 
um, and, yeah. and what in what you created. Yeah. Um, in terms you know, I of think, liminality. Yeah, I think really what I enjoy about this sort of technique. So it's it's called a double exposure, where you can do multiple exposures, like the the three that was that was three different photographs on the same frame of film. Um, so all of the square images as a part of the show were all made on, on film. Um, and something that I love about that is that it allows you this room to um, think about, because you're real. When we took the photograph, you're real. And both of those, those shots, right? But when they come together, they just create this sort of ethereal type of reality. And it is a reality because again, you are real. And you were real when we made these photographs together. And I think what I enjoy the most about playing with that is trying to find a way to sort of connect different modes of thinking. So can we think about um, how can we elevate our thinking or how can we change our thinking around a topic um, and represent that as something that is, is sort of, I need the, I need the words here, um, that exists at the same time that we in our current state of mind exist. And I, I think sort of the feeling that I had as we were walking through the forest and, and finding a good spot is I, you know, my engineering brain kind of took over um, and I wanted to sort of prove your, the connection with the animal true. Um, I wanted to, you know, like an equation, I can't help myself. I wanted to solve for X, right? Um, and maybe some other variables in there, but really in my head, I was like, you know, a lot of your work shows this ethereal nature um, of being and of, of living and of people and, and, and of animals. And I, I wanted to make that come to life in a way. I wanted to prove that to be true so that if you did don this mask, you know, what would happen? Um, what, what could we create? What could we show? Um, how can we show two realities in one space? And so I didn't have the words for that, but just, I had the, I don't know, I just get ideas or images in my head and I have to go make them. And the, the words will come later. They always come later. But in the moment, I just have this very clear nudge. Maybe it's not a nudge. It's more than a nudge. It's a, it's a, it's a poke. It's a, it's a solid poke. Like go do this, go do this in this way here and then again engineering brain comes in you know here's your here's the goal right here's the goal image but you have these factors that you can play with and that could make it different and better than what you have in your head and it's okay to allow those things to come true it doesn't have to be this set image that you're going in with playing and where i think was most important is the collaboration between us two is what I, I think allowed me to go from, all right, I have this feeling, I have this image that's in my head to this is way more than I could even think of, um, you know, sort of before you and I got together. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think I just kind of go into it knowing what the, the technique of a multiple exposure photograph can do. I go into it knowing like, I want these sort of things to happen, um, but then I also give myself permission to allow what I think are parameters and what I think need to happen change. Um, because that's, we've been talking about wizards and magic and enchanted forests, but that's really where the magic happens is where you're, you get together with someone and you play off of each other's energy, you play off of each other's ideas. For me, I got to sort of delve into you and your work um, and, and try to, um, try to emulate the quality of that to complement your work so that, I don't know, I just had this idea that, you know, I want what we show to be cohesive and I want it to be, um, in conversation with each other instead of, um, separate in, in a way I wanted it to all fit. I wanted it to mesh. Um, so I also went into, into collaborating with you the second time, because if you notice the first time, the images from the first time there, I think I used, I, I selected one, um, because just that second time that we spent together was just so powerful. Um, and I really felt like the work that you and I did together 
um, really hit all those sort of ideas that I had in my head of, of what, what I should um, contribute to, to this collaboration. You know, something I like in the photos, like when I read into it, like that wasn't planned is just that the outfit is very much like a tree with the green on the top and the brown on the bottom. And I didn't think of think of that in, in what I put on, but it kind of makes it like a lot like a tree spirit, like a spirit, like a spirit of the, of the, you know, like if when we, when we like visualize, you know, spirits, it's like a, a, a lot of times like, um, uh, like personified as like a human being coming out, you know, as though like a spirit ha has a human in or a tree has a human inside, you know, that's its, you know, that's its um, soul, you know, funny thought, um, but, uh, but it has that vibe to me. And then also I have this, um, um, this uh, buck skull that's on a shed outside of my house. And then when we're walking by it, I'm like, oh, why don't we grab this? It's just on a whim. But you know, like that skull as like, um, like a symbol of death, you know, like the bone and skull would be like uh, this, um, you know, the symbol of death. Uh, so it very much like creates this, this vibe of like, of like all of um, like an ancestral consciousness of like all of the um, all of the animals, the generations of animals that have lived there um, over time, um, like all of the indigenous people who are in that live there all the time over time, you know, like all the bones and and spirit of everyone that's been on this land and this continent and this mother earth all this time is present with us you know and so to just take a moment and reflect on that you know and i think this photography creates a moment to reflect on that um because um you know we've also talked too about how this style of photography kind of suggests uh a connection to spirit and ancestors and ways to play with that and um and yeah it's like there there um doesn't need to be some kind of like mystical trip you need to be on to like get into like what's actually going on here on earth of like the generations um you know generations and generations of people, beings, life, being here, and like, you know, that's really like the voice I want to come out of my work the most is like, like, how do we re-enter sacred relationship with, um, um, with life, you know, all life. So, um, yeah, I just dig, dig these photos <laughs> because of the suggesting, suggesting some of that, you know, some of yeah. that, like, Cross, um, um, yes, that liminality and presence. You know, there's the presence in the forest. You feel it like the, you felt that when you were in the forest. And I, I'll say like, um, so I, I grew up with um, a forest behind my parents' house. Um, you know, go camping regularly. And you know, I'm I don't get a chance to to be in nature every day, but you know, when I do, excuse me for a second. Um, when I do, I have to say the feeling that I feel in your forest is different. And I've I've stopped to try to notice, and it's and I don't know what it is, but I think it's a lot of what you just spoke about, where you know, you don't have to. There doesn't have to be this big grand thing that makes you more aware of your surroundings and makes you more aware of sort of the the lineage of the land that you're on and the lineage of us um more than just you and me but us as as a culture and us as a culture that's continuing to grow and advance um you don't have to do something huge in order to stop and pay attention 
and to listen and to observe and to be still. I think there's a lot of, um, there's not a lot of opportunity to be still unless you make that opportunity. And I think what I appreciate it most is this was this work that we made together was a reminder that I need to do that. Um, and that, you know, being able to understand generations that I may not be able to name, um, but are, that are there are accessible to me. Um, it's not this big lofty, um, not this big lofty sort of trip that you said that you have to go on or, you know, they're not so distant. Sure, they're distant, but they're not as distant as I think they are. And, you know, I think that's an important message and important space to create. And one that we need, we, I, you know, I, I think we need reconnection back to what's, uh, what used to be foundational or rooted in us. Because with, and I think you and I have talked about this with our consumer attitude with our consumer relationship with um, the world, we, we are far from the sort of the roots of the generations that came before us. And it's, we need to return. Shri, can we move forward in the, um, yeah. Um, I just wanted to share um, this um, painting that is, uh, I have an upcoming show in April at um, Second Street. And, um, and this is one of the paintings um, that's part of the show. And, um, and like for me in this conversation of like rooting down in place and thinking about the ancestors of that place, um, animal, human, tree, all of them, you know, it really makes me think on my own ancestor, ancestors um, on my, um, now on my mother's side from Korea and realizing that, that they are present, um, that they're present with me, even though I'm disconnected from my mother's motherland. Um, so this has got me on the idea of developing the concept of the daughter land and that the, that this Turtle Island, America is not, cannot be my motherland because of the, my bones are not in this land, but that doesn't make my own motherland unaccessible to me, that I still, um, my mother's daughter and my grandmother's granddaughter. And so I've, I've been in a process of reclaiming that lineage and that perspective of way of thinking of the land. And it's incredible because where I am right now is the 38th parallel, which is the parallel that divides, the same parallel that divides North Korea and South Korea. And so, uh, so like we're like the same, like we're like along the same line and there's ginseng, deer, all of these same chestnuts, persimmons, all these same things we're harvesting, all these same ways that, that the indigenous people have, have like created their like, ways of honoring um and existing in nature so um so this so that's that's like the next way of thinking in the, in my line of work of like of feeling the felt presence of my ancestors and representing that in conversation uh, of the korean diaspora on turtle island i cannot wait to see this work in person and to, to see the show um, it's going to be beautiful. It really is. Um, so I think Kristen had entered something in the chat. If you wanted to ask any questions, um, to, to Misha and I, you can go ahead and type those in. Um, I think we'll be able to see them. I think Shri can see them as well. Yeah, actually would love to pop in with my own question while we wait for oh. um, people to submit more. I'm gonna jump back in the slides a little because I have a specific question about, um, and this is to Misha and then maybe Corey, you could, um, I think this question is also relevant to your own creative practice too. But I was wondering a little bit about the writing um, and kind of, you had talked about how a lot of um, this series of work is a lot more spontaneous or less planned than your paint paintings are. 
Um, but I was also curious, is the, the writing that you include in these something that also comes as a, like a, a flow or as a spontaneous thing that happens while you're creating a piece? And is what you've written in the pieces um, relevant in some way to the, the work itself? Um, in the first, the deer piece, I took a poem I'd previously written and put it in that uh, put it in that piece. Um, but for the horse, um, for the or horse one, I wrote it for the piece. And I'm really excited about this because I always like wish that like all the parts of myself, like the poet, the activist, the like um, like my spirituality, my my you know way I live my life like everything can come together in one like grand thing and you're like wow that's me you know and like I guess like you just like after enough time of just doing your thing like it can't like it, it can come together because you're just doing it so um um so yeah I'm really would you want to hear the poem absolutely okay, okay. um this is the poem on the horse then. okay Wildness come into me, ah, hold on. Wildness come into me, deeper, deeper, please. Runner through ages, heard mind hears. Sense maker, shh, let ancestors answer. Rush, rush through chaos forests, a little more animal. Because our bodies long for two decade to one, to zero in the black womb and every moment born. Because country is a long two-legged walk alone. Because minus kin, we are orphan if siblings forgot. All these new shiny things made of suffering, made of zero ones and zeros, wildness make me whole. All these zones of blood and grammar and fuck you drones, mother wailing minus. Wildness make we whole. Horse six legged, we are beast soul flown. Drum clap gallop along the lay of land. Through clear cut chaos, dreams of full survival. Wildness make me whole. Water take we home. So yeah, I'd love to be like I I dig combining the the poetry and the visual because you know you're a writer and visual artist and it's like there's some things you could say in one and and not the other and and like if you could put everything together and and have it work then it's like you have like a a, a multifaceted experience. Yeah, I really love that. And I think the writing works so well with these pieces because we've had a lot of people come into the gallery and spend a lot of time with these works specifically um, and trying to connect the, the words that you've written with the pieces themselves and like the story that you're trying to tell through all of the works. Yeah, that was cool to see in the gallery people spending the time to read it because that doesn't always happen. They wanted the key in. And I think that's also what, what makes it so powerful is that more often than not, people don't expect to see the words when you come for a visual art show. And so when it is there, I think it takes people by surprise and holds them a little bit longer. And I actually, um, since we don't, and we have a little bit of time and since nobody's asking any questions, I have one for Corey. Um, Corey, I actually, I remember you talking about the double exposure um, photography a little while back. And I am curious if it's something new that you've been working on, or is it something that we're gonna see a lot more of as you continue to share more work? Yeah, um, so it's something that I've kind of just been messing around with for probably the last three to four years, maybe a little longer than that. Uh, a friend of mine who's also a photographer 
um, introduced me to film and was like, here's your first role film. Here's a camera. We're going to make some portraits together and never saw those because I think they were all overexposed, but I, I caught the bug. I caught the film bug. Um, and then I realized, wait, I can make two images in one and there's a lot of play here. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to experiment with this. So um, I think this is the first work that I've really shown that's got, that's on film um, using this technique. And I think there is definitely more play here, um, both with film and kind of having the same sort of technique, but being able to, to do some other things, some crazier things with it in Photoshop um, as well. So I, I think there's absolutely more to come. Does anybody else in the audience have any more questions for our two artists? All right, if not, um, I would, I'm gonna jump in to say thank you to both of you, Misha and Corey for being here with us tonight and for sharing about this body of work. Um, it has honestly been such a pleasure to be able to hear some of the stories behind it because over the course of the past six months, um, Kristen and I have heard like inklings of hidden things that haven't been fully shared. And so finally be being able to see the full series together in the gallery has been amazing. So thank you both for joining us. Um, and I wanna mention, I'm gonna jump forward a bunch of slides uh, to mention that you, can, you guys can come and see this show. Um, which is inside the artist studio, along with Misha and Corey's works, which are featured in the show, in person anytime from now through January 22nd. Second Street Gallery is open to the public Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 11 to 5 p.m., no appointment necessary. We will also be posting a, a short video tour of the exhibition um, sometime right after the new year. So for those of you who aren't tuning in from uh, the Charlottesville or Central Virginia area, you should be able to take a look at that on our YouTube or our website in early January. You can also browse and purchase work from the exhibition. So any of the works that you've seen throughout this slideshow um, are actually available through our online store and in person. Um, and I'm gonna jump forward to talk about a couple of events that we have coming up at Second Street Gallery. So this Saturday, um, from 11 to 4 p.m., we have a mini gallery rally, which is inspired by our other group exhibition, The Third Mind, which is on view in the Beauvais Gallery. During this event, you can watch some of your favorite artists collaborate in pairs to create artworks live in the gallery. All of the work created during this event will be available for $100 in person and online. You can check out our website for more information on which artists are participating and when, but uh, our lovely Misha Goldberg will actually be one of the participating artists this weekend. And we have a workshop next week on Wednesday evening. We'll be hosting a hands-on holiday printmaking workshop with the Third Mind artist, Ryan Trott. During this workshop, you'll get to play with some simple printmaking techniques and personalized greeting cards and gift wrap to take home. This workshop is family-friendly and open to all ages, and you can RSVP on our website. That is all of the events updates that I have. Um, again, I'd like to thank Corey and Misha for coming out and sharing about your work with us. And I wanna thank all of you at home for tuning in to watch this. And that's all from me. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all, this was a delight. <laughs>